Hey everyone, Chris here from Varsity Gaming, and welcome back to the 12th episode of Siege School. Today I'm going to be discussing the Blood Orchid DLC. Blood Orchid is the 6th DLC in Siege, not including Operation Health. It'll introduce 3 new operators and a ton of new changes that'll basically revamp the entire game. But first, the operators. First, there's Lesion. He's the Hong Kong defender that can place down goo traps. Goo is the Mandarin word for poison. He's essentially setting up poison dart traps with cloaking devices. He can put them down anywhere on the floor, and as an attacker walks over them, they get hit for 10 damage and take damage over time. As the attacker has a goo needle in their leg, they cannot sprint and move slower. The needle can be removed by holding the action key, but puts the person at a vulnerable state. The next operator is Ying, the Hong Kong attacker. She has flashbang cluster charges, which are called candelas. They operate in similar fashion to fuse cluster charges. The difference is that they can be timed and not remote detonated. The candelas have three different states, with each state being longer than the previous. These candelas can either be rolled on the floor or placed on a destructible surface to set off. The flashbangs inside the candelas blind everyone, including attackers and defenders, except for Ying herself. She is immune to them. We'll move on to the last operator, Ella, the Polish defender. She has Grismont concussion mines which stick to surfaces. They detonate when attackers within proximity and apply a yokai-like concussion effect to the operator. It also makes the attacker slower and is harder to turn and aim. But unlike Yokai, the effect is shorter and does not disappear quicker by sitting still. It has a set amount of time and it will just disappear after that no matter what you're doing. And now that we have the operators covered, we're going to move on to new content and big changes happening in Blood Orchid. For new content, we have the new map, Theme Park. Theme Park won't be available in the rank cycle, but it will be available in casual. So for the most part, it unfortunately won't affect the meta of the game. At least for the time being. It might be added into the map cycle in the future, but for now it is restricted to only casual and custom games. And because of this, I'm not going to delve too far into the map, instead I'm going to move on to the big changes happening in Blood Orchid. These first few changes are a direct result of Operation Health. Blood Orchid is considered to be the final installation of the Operation Health season fixes. The first big one is that servers are being upgraded. There were previously 50 tick servers and are now being upgraded to 60 tick. This might not be a huge change, but it will definitely affect hit registration, rubber banding, and disconnecting for most players across the board. This will overall increase the stability of the game and definitely make it feel more reliable. The next big change is the lighting system. The lighting has been changed completely across the game. All maps are now consistent and you can see inside and out perfectly fine. So for once looking outside through a hole in the wall will no longer feel like you're looking at God's gaping asshole. And next is textures. They've been updated and changed drastically across a lot of the maps. Some maps don't even look the same anymore. They've been optimized so they can make more room for future content and also look a lot better for each player. Playing on low settings no longer makes it look like Minecraft, instead it actually looks like a real game. These new textures definitely bridge the gap between low settings and high settings. And speaking of textures, operator models have also been updated to look a lot cleaner and more consistent. Which also means that a lot of them no longer look like they're on meth. I had to deal drugs. And the last of the big changes is that Hibana has been fixed. Again. For the 50th time. And I'll see you guys in the next patch notes when she gets fixed for the 51st time. And now that we have the big changes covered, we're going to move on to the tweaks and improvements to the game's health. Smokes have been drastically changed. They are no longer slow forming clouds that are being locally generated on your machine. Instead, they are now a giant box of opaque smoke that you cannot see through. And with this change, that means operators can only carry two smoke grenades now instead of three, just because of how powerful they are. And on top of that, they're much more consistent between each game. So you'll no longer have issues of enemies shooting you through smoke when you can't see anything, but they can clearly see you. This change is also applied to Capital Bolts, and the Capital Bolts are no longer blue, they are currently grey. However, Ubisoft has said that they will change this in the future. And important to note that this change does not affect Smoke's gas canisters. Smoke still has the old school system of smoke, which means that it can be a little bit more inconsistent. So the issues might remain where on your computer you are outside of the smoke, but you're still taking damage. And the next change is that Jaeger and Bandit have lost their ACOGs. Currently, no other operators have received them in their place, but Ubisoft has gone on the record to say that they do not want any 3 or 2 speed operators having ACOGs on their gun. They believe it's too strong that an operator can peek outside with a 2.5 times scope and then relocate very quickly. Instead, they want to keep the ACOG on only the 1 speed operators, that way if they choose to peek outside, they can't run away very quickly, they have to slowly take their time. This overall does not mean an end to spawn peeking, but definitely will help a bit. And next is weapon falloff damage. Previously, each weapon had individual falloff damage points. So essentially there's two points. The point where damage slowly starts to decrease, and the point where it stops decreasing at all and has a consistent value from there on out. So with Blood Orchid, each weapon category has two different points. Marksman rifles begin to fall off damage at 25 meters and end at 40 meters. 
LMGs fall off at 25 meters and end at 40 meters. Assault rifles fall off at 25 meters and end at 35 meters. SMGs fall off at 18 meters and end at 28 meters. Machine pistols fall off at 18 meters and end at 28 meters. This would include the Bering 9 SMG 11. And pistols fall off at 12 meters and end at 22 meters. This doesn't affect Glaz's sniper rifle or shotguns as Ubisoft has said they want those to keep their own independent values. And speaking of weapons, ammo counts are also being changed. A variety of guns across the board are receiving between 1 to 4 extra magazines of ammo. This will help operators who have far too little ammo for specific guns such as Twitch with their 417 marksman rifle. And please note that the amount of ammo per magazine isn't changing, they're just getting extra magazines of ammo. Moving on to another change, two drones can now be deployed at once for attackers. Previously, if an attacker already had their first drone out and decided to throw their second drone, the first drone would be automatically destroyed. Now that's no longer the case. Operators can have both drones out at the same time and swap between them easily. This is the same type of rule that applies to Twitch's shock drones and will make it a lot easier for attackers to coordinate. And that's it for the big improvements to game health. There are other ones, but I'm not going to get too far into them, mainly because it's very hard to showcase them, as well I really don't have too much to talk about them. And now we're going to move on to player comfort. This generally means quality of life improvements and UI changes. The first big one is that defenders no longer have a yellow filter when running outside. Previously, if you ran outside of the building to where the attackers were, you would get a giant yellow filter over your screen and red text saying that you're being detected. So now the yellow filter is being taken away, but the red text is staying. The reason for this is because the red text should be enough to let defenders know that they're running outside of bounds. However, this is also an indirect buff to more experienced players. Players who want to do runouts will now have a much easier time doing so when they can clearly see enemies everywhere. The yellow filter made that significantly harder as you could not always tell exactly where people were as they would kind of blend into the background. And I've played on the technical test servers. I can tell you with confidence that it is much easier to run out and kill the attackers. Especially with the new lighting fixes, when you can clearly see them and have no filter on your screen, it is very easy to land all your shots. So we'll see with time whether Ubisoft decides to revert this change or not. And next is a nice quality of life change for defenders on cameras. Alive players now have priority on cameras over dead players. Previously, if a person was dead and AFK on a camera, no one else would have the ability to move it and the camera would just stay in one position for the rest of the round. Now, if an alive player moves onto that camera, they will now have complete control of it over the dead person. This is hugely important for those situations where you really need to check the cameras to make callouts and your dead teammates aren't doing that for you. And the last quality of life change that I'm going to talk about is the big change to auto-detecting enemies. So previously before, crosshairs would turn red when you were looking at enemies, and if you looked at them long enough or saw enough of them, it would say plus 10 points ID enemy. This led to a lot of situations where people would accidentally ID someone and then freak out because they didn't realize that they were looking straight at someone. This would lead to a lot of kills on their end because they suddenly realized, hey, I'm looking at someone and would land the shot. And now the crosshair will no longer turn red, and the only way that you can get an ID on an enemy is by scanning them with a camera, drone, or jackal's footprint scanner. So now you can no longer walk through a giant open area and just ID enemies when you're not even noticing. This will really suck for inattentive people, but on the overall is much better for the health of the game. You don't want people accidentally noticing people when they're really not paying attention. Alright, now with quality of life changes covered, we're going to move on to the playlist changes. This is talking about the new maps in rotation on Ranked. Previously, every single map was available in Ranked and Casual. There was absolutely no difference between the two as far as map pool went. But now Casual and Ranked are going to have different map pools. Ranked is going to co-align with the ESL Pro League. So that means the only maps that will be available in Ranked starting in Blood Orchid are Bank, Clubhouse, Oregon, Cafe, Consulate, Chalet, Border, Coastline, and Skyscraper. These maps have been deemed balanced enough for competitive play based on the ESL Pro League. However, for Casual, all maps will be in rotation starting next season except for Favela and Yacht. These two maps are only going to be available in custom games and in the future will be completely removed from the game. According to Ubisoft, this is happening because of an issue with data caps. They've mentioned that they're reaching their data limit for the game and that with each new map coming in, they're getting closer and closer to reaching it. So the best way to make up room in the game is to remove maps completely. Personally, I don't agree with this and I think Ubisoft should find another way to get around the data cap. Whether that be increasing it or making some changes to the engine, I really don't know. I don't have enough experience with game design to really comment on that, but I really think they should work to just increase the data cap as opposed to just completely remove content. I understand that the maps weren't completely balanced and a lot of people really didn't like them for competitive play, but really on the overall this game is meant to be fun. It's not only about competitive play. Don't punish the players who like to have fun and just goof around in the game just because players want to be super competitive in it. And lastly with this playlist change is that map preferences have been completely removed from the game. 
Previously, you could go into the options and choose which maps you want to play, but really it did nothing at all. And Ubisoft has even commented on this saying that basically the map preferences were not working as intended, so they just decided to completely remove them and just put in these new map pools instead. And that's it for the playlist changes. Now we're going to move on to the balancing changes. The first one is a big one. Barbed wire no longer slows as much as it used to, and it now takes two hits to break instead of three. This was done because barbed wire was considered too strong of a gadget and often was a must pick for most operators. This would involve teams bringing between four to eight sets of barbed wire and placing them all over the objective, pretty much preventing attackers from pushing in a lot of the time. So they've decided to nerf it and this will hopefully bring other gadgets pick rates up and if not will at least make barbed wire not a huge enemy to attackers. Next in the balances is that Jacko's special ability has now been updated. His tracking now pings more frequently and has more pings overall. It is now every 5 seconds for 20 seconds for a total of 5 pings, instead of every 10 seconds for 30 seconds for a total of 4 pings. This will make it much easier to intercept a defender as they're trying to run away, as you'll get updates much more frequently. Previously when it was 10 seconds, a 3 speed operator could easily run across the map in those 10 seconds, now with only 5 seconds they really can't get too far. And this next change is one that I really do not agree with, and I really think Ubisoft has dropped the ball here. Bandit can now destroy Hibana pellets mid-detonation slash charge. So previously, if a Hibana was putting down her pellets and she set off the charge, Bandit could not destroy them. Even if you put down a Bandit battery after the Hibana pellets fuse went off, you would not destroy them at all. They were completely immune to it. Now Bandit can put down his battery after they've been set off and easily destroy them. This made Bandit tricking ridiculously easier. Even if Thermite and Hibana both put down their gadgets at the same time, Bandit can just put down one battery on each wall as soon as he hears them being placed and easily destroy both of them. This has made Hibana incredibly weak, especially for breaching walls. However, I will say that this definitely balances her out. Now she's going to be more of a pick to go for hatches as opposed to walls. And this will definitely bring Thermite's pick rate back up as he is much more necessary for breaching walls now. And on top of that, the Bandit batteries will now also one hit destroy the gadgets. Previously it was 2 to 3 hits, which meant that if a drone was driving through barbed wire that was electrified, it had a chance to get out without being destroyed. Now, as soon as the drone touches that bandit electricity, it will be destroyed immediately. Next is a change to IQ. Her scanner can no longer detect friendly gadgets, and can also see Echo on his arm pad while he's using his yokai. This is a pretty decent change because IQ will definitely have a higher pick rate at the beginning of the season. With two new defenders coming in that both use electronic gadgets that can be detected by IQ, she's going to be much more important to destroy them, especially since Legion's gadget is cloaked and cannot be seen without the IQ scanner. Now there will be a lot less clutter on her screen, and she won't have to determine what's a friendly gadget and what's an enemy gadget. And the last change I'm going to talk about in the balances is that Sledge's hammer is much more consistent and has more noticeable environmental damage. This also seems to have affected shotguns at the same time. This is most noticeable in Mira's pocket shotgun, which now makes huge holes in walls, when before it was very hard to make a hole at all. So destruction definitely seems to be much more consistent and much more reliable. And will definitely make it much easier for people who are trying to make holes into objective to watch in. And that's it for the balances. As far as bug fixes go, there are far too many bug fixes for me to go through individually. Really all I can tell you is just imagine the game is better and hopefully it actually is better when the full DLC launches. Beyond that, if you really want to go through and see every single bug fix, the link is down below in the description. And that is it for the information segment of this video. And now we're going to move on to the quiz show segment. For those of you who don't know how it works, basically I ask you a question, give you 10 seconds on the clock to come up with an answer, and if your answer is close to what mine is, then you can give yourself a point. At the end of the quiz, I'll put up scores on the screen showing you how well you did based on how many questions you got right. And since today's Siege School is more on changes happening in the game and not something concrete in the game, I'm just going to ask you guys two simple questions today. Which basically means school will let out early so you guys can go have fun. Now with that all covered, let's get into the quiz segment. Question 1. Approximately how many bug fixes are being implemented into Blood Orchid? With 10 seconds on the clock, go. Time's up. And the answer is over 1,300 bug fixes. Keep in mind, a lot of them are very generic and small little fixes, but on the overall, that is a huge amount of bugs being fixed. And if you're really daring enough to read it all, they do have a lot of Easter eggs hidden throughout the patch notes. And it's time for the bonus question. Where does this new Blood Orchid seasonal skin come from? With 10 seconds on the clock, go.
time's up. The skin is the same texture used on the vases on coastline. There's a lot of theory in the community about why this is happening. A lot of people are saying, oh, it just looks like a nice skin, so they decided to use it. Others are saying that this is a way that they're trying to get around the whole memory limit thing. The way they'd be getting around it is by basically just reusing textures and applying them to guns. So I'm interested to see if in the future we get a lot more skins like this. And that'll conclude today's episode of Siege School. I do want to add that I'm sorry for anyone who was expecting to learn something new today. I wanted to do a video on a specific subject, but unfortunately I was too afraid of anything changing throughout the next week. I didn't want to make a video talking about a specific operator and then find out by the time Blood Orchid gets released that that operator has been changed in some significant way. So instead I decided to just cover the patch notes and show you guys what's happening. So again, sorry if you were expecting a specific topic, but I hope you still learned something from this video anyways. And I will add as an extra note, I did not cover every single thing in the patch notes. There were a few topics I left out just because it was kind of hard to talk about them, so if you really want to read them, then just make sure to follow the link in the description below to the patch notes. But anyways, moving on, here are the scores based on how many questions you got right. Basically, if you got them all right, then we know that you're a Redditor slash someone who actually reads the patch notes. But either way, let me know what score you got down below. And as per usual, my two quick plugs before I go. One, I do stream on Twitch every single day, except for Wednesday starting this week. I'll be taking Wednesdays off because I'm going back to school, but I'll still be streaming every single other day of the week. This weekend I have decided to take a break from Siege just because I played on the technical test servers and I really do not want to go back to the standard servers. So instead this weekend I'll be streaming a bunch of extra games and even tonight, the day that this episode has gone live, I will be doing a drunk stream playing a bunch of party games with chat. And I will be going back to mainly just playing Siege once Blood Orchid launches, so on Tuesday. So if you want to watch any of that, make sure to tune in by following the link on the screen or in the description below and make sure to follow or subscribe. And my second plug, the Siege School shirt is available on our store. If you want to check it out, then make sure to follow the link in the description or at the end of the video in the end slate. These shirts are a good way for you to support the channel as well as for you to get something out of it. And that's it for my plugs, and that's it for the video. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video, and I'll see you in the next episode of Siege School. Take care.